this morning to share with you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as you've heard through the variety of songs in which we've heard sung, as well as the testimony and the scriptures already read, I'm going to talk to you just for a few minutes about the simple gospel message. He talked about being on his father's side, and he talked about his mother's side. He also talked about the old rugged cross. But today I want to ask you a question as the Apostle Paul, writing the church of Corinth, writing to a group of folks who he had the privilege of preaching to, seeing them repent, seeing them turn and trust in Jesus and planning a church. But he writes back to them to correct several things but he also writes to just encourage them in the truth that changed their life. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain." For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. And after that He was seen of James, and then of the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. Not am I meet to be called, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecute the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you. I ask you to move in, in our midst as I preach your word. I ask for your anointing to preach. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, save the lost, speak to the hearts of us who are already saved here and abroad as we give you the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Those who are standing. I want to take just a few moments to share with you and talk to you about the simple gospel. We gather every single week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We have a variety of things in which we do in trying to spread the gospel, whether it's through bus ministries, children ministries, whether it's through a variety of media outlets in which we try to get the gospel out to personal evangelism when we're out and about our own. But why? But why? Well, the Apostle Paul, right in the church of Corinth, is there, and he, he had already been there, but he writes back there to them, and he reminds them of when he came. And he says unto them, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Now, this morning, I want us to understand the very foundation of life is found in the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we talk about the good news of Jesus, something is implied, and the implication is that there had to be some type of bad news. Well, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it tells us that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Earlier in Romans chapter 3, it tells us that there is none good, no, not one. There is none righteous, for all of us have gone out of the way. All of us have become unprofitable before God. He says that there is cursing in, in, from, in our lips and in, in of our tongues is as the poison of snakes. He says that there is none good amongst humanity. How many understand that when we look out here in this world, that it has been infected and affected by the reality of a three-letter word called sin? It means to miss the mark of God's perfection and His holiness. And when we look out here amongst humanity, if you look starting very close in your own relationship, and that's with yourself, when you look in the mirror, do you know what you see when you're honest with yourself? You're seeing somebody who's apart from Jesus who has fallen, somebody who is corrupt for the very core of our being. You don't have to teach children how to be bad. You have to teach them how to do good. You don't spend the, your entire life um, trying to 
to um, get worse, you spend your entire life trying to get better, right? That's what people do. They, from the very time when they come in the world, you, you're teaching your children what is right. You tell them what to stay away from what is wrong. You and I go about in our life as we grow up trying to be better people. That's what we should be doing. But what we learn is that man left to himself cannot accomplish what is good. In fact, we're all sinners. So the apostle Paul says, Brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the one who would come, God in the flesh, as you've already heard, who lived amongst sinful humanity, who is tempted in all ways like unto man, yet he himself never sinned. And the Bible says that he who did not sin was willing to become our sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so the apostle Paul says to the church of Corinth, listen, you remember that when I came unto you, I declared unto you the gospel. I preached unto you the gospel. Earlier in 1 Corinthians, the very beginning of the letter, the apostle Paul says, it is by the foolishness of preaching that God chooses to save the lost. And so the simple proclamation of the death of the Lord Jesus, the God-man, and the resurrection of Jesus, who is the God-man, conquered sin and conquered death and conquered Satan and gave salvation to all who repent of their sin and turn and trust in him. He says, I came and proclaimed unto you, I preached unto you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, folks, I want us to understand that what is the most important decision that we'll ever make in our life that has an eternal impact is what do we do with the simple gospel message? What do you do with that? Maybe today you're here and you don't know Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior and you're in a state of sin. You're in a place that is separated from God. You're in a place in which the Bible describes you as an enemy of God, someone subject to the wrath of God. If somebody who is a sinner is not somebody who is a child of God. I know what the world says. The world says things like we're all children of God, but the Bible says different than that. The Bible says in order for you and I to become a child of God, you've got to receive the Son of God. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, but as many as received him, talking about Jesus, to them gave he the power or the right or the authority to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. And so the apostle Paul, right in the church of Corinth, says, I want you to be reminded of what I shared with you. Then I, I want you to be reminded after he corrected them over several things. He corrected them about the division that was going on in their church. He talked about the immorality that was going on in their church. He talked about uh, the abuse of spiritual gifts that were going on in their church. He, He talked about a variety of things that were happening in the church. And when you get over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he's talking about the resurrection primarily. But to get to the resurrection, you got to talk about the death of Christ. So he's talking about the gospel. And he says, I want you to remember, brethren, that I declared unto you the gospel that I preached unto you. And then he says this, in which you have received and wherein you stand. Uh, Today, folks, I want us to understand the necessity of receiving the gospel, receiving the message of the death of Jesus, the Son of God, God the Son, who took on humanity, who took on our sin, who went to our cross as our sacrifice, and how he gave his life and shed his blood and took it up again so we could be reconciled to our God. He said, I want you to remember that and receive the good news. 25 plus years ago, I received the gospel. I had heard it a few times throughout the summer of 1998. I'd heard it from my friends that I worked with. I heard it when I went to church with them occasionally throughout the summertime. But in the fall of 98, there was a change that happened in my life because It went from hearing it to receiving it. Folks, you and I need to look around here in this world and understand that that this world is not heading in a good place. I mean, if you just flipped on the TV from the other day, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but if you just flipped on the TV, and I didn't, I don't like to watch the Olympics. I think it's about stupid, to be honest with you. 
Okay, and it's even confirmed that over the last little bit. I think it's silly. It's sports I've never watched. I never pay attention to. And I don't even understand that people spend four years or longer working to become masters at sports that nobody cares about, but every four years. So it's kind of silly to me. But you see what's going on in the world today. You have the mockery of the Lord's Supper. If we were to stand, if I was to stand up here today and just simply tell you the truth of sin and the lifestyles that our culture says is okay and accepted, a whole lot of people are going to be mad at me. And I can talk to you about a lot of things, and I'm not afraid to worry about people being mad at me. I promise you that. And you all know me, I already know that. But, but if we were to get up on a worldwide stage and call the drag queens as they are and that of perversion, then they would be, then we will be criticized for such. But on the flip side of the coin, we live in a culture that drag queens, which are perversions, which seems to be very close to being reprobate minds, can mock and ridicule the Lord Jesus and nobody seem to care from a national level. From that, not only that, that's one part of it, but if you've paid any attention to what was going on, there was some of the acts of the worship of Baal to to even a, 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 a depiction or a picture of, of what was happening in Revelation chapter 6 is they had somebody riding around on a white horse, almost as if it was Antichrist himself coming on the scene. Satan himself doesn't hide anymore, folks. Uh, Satan doesn't have to, to even clothe himself as a minister of righteousness, as the Bible would describe that he does from time to time. In fact, he seems to have come out the closet in a very dramatic way in which he is presenting himself before the world and his evilness and his perversion and his ways contrary to, to that of the scriptures and the world is embracing it. If you look out in the world, folks, we're in a messed up place. It's a dark place. It's an evil place. And it can become disheartening, but let me tell you something about the good news of the gospel, folks. Satan, sin, evil will not put out the light of the gospel. The darker the world gets, the brighter the light of the gospel will shine, folks. <clears throat> and so I think we have to look at it from the right perspective. I fear not Satan. I worry not about his tactics. I know the power of the gospel. I know the person of the Holy Spirit. I know the plan of God as what the scripture says. And I know the command and the commission that God has given his church to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. And though it may be dark, Jesus, the light of the world, shines bright, folks. And because of that, we have to understand the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I see the reality of sin. I know what Jesus says about the reality of hell. I know that those who die without Jesus will not go to heaven, but will open their eyes in torment. But I also know that God's desires for all men to be saved. And I do also understand that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And I also know that Jesus is tearing his return, that men may have an opportunity to repent and be saved. And I know as long as we're here, he's here. And as long as that we are, are here, we're called to share the gospel, that people may receive him and be gloriously saved. Today, if you don't know Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior, uh, the question is, why not receive him? Why not receive the gospel? He goes on to say that we are to stand. He said not only is the gospel that he preached the gospel to be received, but he said also the gospel by which we are supposed to stand. He says in verse 2, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached on you unless you have believed in vain. I read the end of, of verse 1 and, and verse 2 together because I want you to understand something. 
Just because you walk an aisle, just because you go through baptismal waters, just because you sing, just because you preach, just because you're a regular attender, just because you gave when the offering plate went around, does not make you fit or ready for the kingdom of God or to spend eternity in the presence of God. Uh, the apostle Paul, writing to the folks of Corinth, uh, he made an assumption they were saved. He called them brethren in verse 1. But he also said in verse 2, that the gospel which you have received and which you stand is also the gospel that saved you. He said, if you keep in memory of what I preached unto you, and this is what he said, unless you believed in vain. Meaning that if you really are born again, folks, there's a change in your life. There's something that happens inside of a person when they get saved. Just as evil and wicked and depraved that we are apart from Jesus and need of a Savior, when you encounter the grace of God that changes your life and you become alive in Him, I assure you, folks, that something changes in you. Nobody has an encounter with a risen Savior that there isn't a change that happens. Oh, I'm not talking about repeating a prayer. I'm not talking about grabbing the preacher by the hand. I'm not talking about doing all the quote-unquote church things that we know we're supposed to do and that we're accustomed to doing if we've been around it enough. I'm not talking about carrying a Bible around. I'm not talking about being able to recite a prayer. I'm talking about having an encounter with the risen Savior that changes your life when you understand that you are standing in the gospel because you have received the gospel and you have believed the gospel, not in vain, but in sincerity. What about you and me today? You know what the problem is with our world? There's a lot of folks out there. Let me tell you what Jesus said. Jesus said the broad path has a lot of people on it. The narrow path, few find it. Let me, let me explain something to you. Not everybody says, Lord, Lord, is saved people. We may have churches on every corner right here in, in Laurel County and, and the Bible Belt and, and America may have churches all over the place. But that don't mean that they save people all over the place. There's a difference. And I'm going to tell you something. The church movement in which we have going on today, the word of God has preached very little. The expectation of being committed to God is very little. But what I hear, what Jesus said in the gospel of Luke and others, is that he tells us that we are to deny ourselves. We're to take up our cross. We're to follow after him. We are to love him above everyone else, meaning our spouse, our children, our parents, our careers, our hobbies, our own fleshly desires, our own self. We're to put Jesus first. A person or a body of believers, supposed believers who are born again, make a decision to put Jesus first. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is what we preach because it's the power of God and the salvation. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is what we are to receive if we're going to have eternal life. You've got to receive him. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is where we stand, folks. We are to stand and not be shaken. He says, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ, here's your gospel, died according to our, for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, folks, this is the gospel. Jesus died for you. The way you sin is death. Jesus paid your debt. He took on your sin. He died in your place. But then he rose from the dead, overcoming our sin. You remember when Jesus was there just right before his crucifixion? And he looks around and he sees the temple and he talks about the destruction of the temple. And then and he says, but you destroy this temple in three days. I'll raise it up. And they thought he was talking about the big temple there. And he could do that too. That was an issue. But he was talking about himself. He had told his disciples already, I must, you know, be handed over to the hands of sinful men. I've got to be crucified. And three days later, I'm going to raise from the dead. 
And so when his cross came and he counted it joy to go to the cross, according to the book of Hebrews, even though he's beaten to a bloody pulp, even though he was spit upon, mocked and ridiculed, even though he was led through Jerusalem, he, he would be as the scapegoat, took outside the city. He would be led up Calvary's hill. He would be nailed to an old rugged cross. He would hang there between two thieves who deserved to die. He'd be ridiculed by both of them. One of them came to his senses, but they both started out ridiculing him. There was a lot of folks that came and said, oh, you're saved by others. Won't you get off the cross? Won't you save yourself? All these things. And after he said a few things, he said something on the cross that was very powerful. And he said, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost. He died. Nobody took his life. Death could not claim him. The way to sin is death. Jesus is sinless, folks. Death had no claim on him. And so he laid down his life for you and for me. And the veil in the temple was tore and, and, and simultaneously with the earthquake from top to bottom, showing now there is access to a holy God for sinful men. And it was through the death of the Lord Jesus. Hebrews says the veil, that is his flesh, was tore for us. But then three days later, just like he said, and just like the Roman authorities paid attention to, he rose from the dead. You say, how do you know they were paying attention? Because they put a stone in front of the door. Because they put an emperor's seal upon that stone. Because they guarded it with some Roman soldiers. And they said, nobody is allowed to go to the tomb till after. Well, the problem was sin couldn't hold them, Satan couldn't hold them, the soldiers couldn't hold them, the seal couldn't hold them, the stone couldn't hold them. And when the women showed up to finish preparing the body of Jesus, he wasn't there, which made perfect sense, right? Just like the angel said, why seek ye the living amongst the dead? For he is not here, he is risen. In fact, he is in Galilee, just like he said. You need to... Go tell his disciples that. And so for you and I that, that are here today, I, I ask you, what are you doing with this gospel? If you've never received Jesus, your own personal Lord and Savior, now's the accepted time. And I'm, I'm cutting it short. I want you to see now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Yesterday's gone. Tomorrow may never come for you. Now is the accepted time for you and for me. You say, you sound kind of urgent. It is urgent. It's not kind of urgent, it's very urgent. As God's dealing with your heart about being saved, you need to take heed to that conviction. You need to take heed to that drawing. John chapter 6 says, except the Father draw him, you cannot be saved. And so he's going to have to do a work in your life. He's doing it now. You need to say yes to him. People say, well, I'll wait until next week. Next week may not come for you. And I'm not talking about dying. You may live another 50 years, 100 years. I don't know how old you are. But that doesn't mean that God's going to keep dealing with you. And if God don't deal with you, you're not coming to him. Let's, let's be clear on that. You don't come on your terms. Does he desire all men to be saved? Yes. Do I believe he's a light that lighteth every man that come in the world? Absolutely. John chapter 1 and verse 9 says that. In John chapter 12, if he's high and lifted up, he draws all men unto himself. Will he draw you? Yes. Does that mean he has to continue? No. The book of Genesis says, In my spirit shall not always strive with man. You, you don't say yes to him. You don't, you don't take heed to him. When he comes to you, he calls you. He, he's drawing you. You're playing with literal eternal fire, folks. So if you don't know Christ, today's the day to come. It's to hear the gospel preach. It's to receive the gospel. If you've received the gospel, I ask you a question. Are you standing in the gospel? Folks, we need the church to stand in the gospel. We've sat around too long. We've slept too long. It's time for the church to stand. It's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to experience the power of the Spirit of God in our lives, taking heed to the Word of God and the calling on our lives to be about the gospel message and the commission of Christ to go and spread it throughout the world. What about you today? If you name the name of Christ, are we standing in it? 
Are we standing in the gospel or upon the gospel? He said, wherein ye stand. And if not, the question needs to be asked, did I receive in vain? Did I receive it in vain? You know what John said in his epistle? He said, you know what? There are folks that went out from us. They were among us, but they, they went out from us because they never were of us. Folks, you name the name of Christ. You say that you're saved. I, I, I'm almost tired of it. I've been preaching for 25 years, been pastor over 22 years. I'm almost at a point of complete frustration when I hear folks say, well, you know, I got saved when I was such and such at Bible school, but ain't darkened the door of a church in 30 years. Don't pick up their Bible. Don't tell nobody else about Jesus, but think they got a ticket going to heaven. I hope you are saved if that's your testimony but I sure wouldn't bank on it. Because if you can go through life as a so-called believer and never deal with the chastisement of Christ, you're not a child of God in the first place. It's time for us to stand in the gospel. And I'm not saying that a saved person can't get away from God for, for a while as far as getting away in their walk. He's always there. But you won't do it without him dealing with you. So what about you today? I'm going to ask Brother Tim, he's going to lead us in another song of invitation. I want us to stand, and as you're standing, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have this altar open. If you need to trust Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to be here. I'll be glad to talk with you. If you've got some other need that you're going to come and do business with God, no matter if you're a member here, a visitor, whatever, I'm going to ask you to come and do, do business with God today. You come as God speaks to you and has spoke to you. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to move during this invitation. Save the lost. If there's somebody that's here right now does not know you as their own personal Lord and Savior, I pray right there where they're at. And they would begin to say yes to you. They'd acknowledge their sin. And they would begin to understand the cross today that you died for their sin, paying their sin debt, and that, they, that you rose from the dead. That they would not just understand that, they would believe in that. And they would trust you, Jesus, as the one true and living God who became a man for them. And that they would say to you, I'm sorry for my sin. And I want to turn from my sin. And I turn to you, Lord Jesus, believing you died for me and rose again, asking you to come into my life as I commit myself to you. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would just move in the hearts of those who are already saved. May we respond to you as you spoke to us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You come. Don't waste any time. You come.